discussion. It all goes with my imagination. It's cutting out. Is that an issue? Okay. I talk really loudly. Can everybody hear me? Nope. Yeah. All right. So Dennis, uh, we're very lucky to have him today. He's the Assistant General Counsel for Microsoft Corporation based here in Chicago in downtown at Lincoln Park, for those of you that are Chicago natives. Uh, he practices at the intersection of law, technology, and business, and provides a wide range of legal support to Microsoft sales, marketing, and operations teams across the United States. Uh, prior to joining Microsoft, Dennis was uh, spent time at both. so much for coming out here today. We really appreciate it. Um, this is the first time I have attended a master's conference. I've heard lots of great things about it, and it's great to see a terrific uh, attendance. So I want to thank the uh, master's conference team. How's the sound? Am I too loud, or is it echoing? You're good. You're good? Okay, great. Um, so yes, so I want to talk a little bit about the importance of embracing what we speak a lot about at Microsoft, the importance of digital transformation. It's a big marketing buzzword, but when I think about digital transformation, what it's all about is embracing technology to help better serve your customers, your clients, and hopefully be more competitive in the marketplace. So I want to share some thoughts about our profession and legal and compliance professionals embracing more digital transformation. And I want to start out with this interesting quote from our CEO. His name is Satya. Nadella Satya became CEO a little bit over four years ago. And like lots of new CEOs, he sent a company-wide email to all employees talking about his thoughts about being a CEO. And he, he added this very interesting quote uh, as part of his uh, email. And he said that ours is not an industry that respects tradition. It only respects innovation. And of course, he was talking about the technology industry. But as I think about this quote, I think it's also applicable to our industry, the legal industry. You know, nowadays our customers and our clients are asking more from us, right? They want more value, they want high quality services, and they want it at a lower cost, right? They're asking us to do more with fewer resources. And I think technology can be a legal professional's best friend to help us better serve our clients. I'd like to reference this interesting book which came out about two and a half years ago. It's called The Fourth Industrial Revolution. It was written by a gentleman named Klaus Schwab. Mr. Schwab is the chairman and executive uh, chairman and founder of, of a group called the World Economic Forum. This is the group of folks who meet once a year in beautiful Davos, Switzerland. They descend upon Davos and they try to figure out how to solve some of the more compelling issues involving our society. And in his book, the fourth industrial revolution. It's Mrs. Mr. Schwab's perspective that we've entered into a whole new era in our society where we're gonna be seeing rapid advancement of technological change, which we've never seen before. And he talks about great developments in the physical space. And we're seeing that with robotics and 3D printing and connected cars. We're gonna see great developments in the biological space. And we're seeing that with the pharmaceutical developments and some great inventions in the DNA space, but we're also seeing it in the digital space, right? And we've seen that over the past few years with the rise of cloud computing, big data, the internet of things, and also now artificial intelligence. So what I wanna do is really focus on these three key digital areas, the cloud, big data, and AI, artificial intelligence. And when I think of cloud computing, I think there's great opportunities for all of us to embrace cloud computing tools, to collaborate better with each other, with our colleagues, with our outside counsel law firms, to learn from each other, and also to be more cyber secure, assuming we're partnering with a trustworthy cloud provider. When I think of data and big data, there's lots of analytics 
and insights which we can all glean from data to help better serve our clients. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then finally, artificial intelligence, right? We've been seeing a lot about that over the last few years and how that's really captured the attention of major media outlets. Some of it may be hype. Artificial intelligence is certainly at its early infancy stages, but I think there's lots of opportunities for us to use AI solutions to achieve more and for lawyers to practice law at what I would call a higher level and to get out of some of the routine, repetitive tasks that so many lawyers have performed over the years. So let's talk a little bit about the cloud, cloud computing. And of course, this is a topic which Microsoft likes a lot because we're uh, a leading cloud services provider. But when you look at the statistics, cloud computing continues to grow exponentially. Right? There's lots of opportunities out there uh, to make money in the cloud computing space. You have companies like my company, you have companies like Amazon, Google, Salesforce, the bigger cloud companies, but there's a number of smaller and mid-sized cloud players out there which are providing terrific solutions to the marketplace. And I think a key point here is the cloud has been what I would call mature technology for quite a while. I remember working on my first cloud computing contract back in uh, about June of 2009, nine years ago with a major uh, customer who was actually in this building. It was the very first cloud computing contract I worked on. Of course, we've learned a lot since that period of time at Microsoft and we've uh, revitalized our cloud services to be more compliant, more trustworthy. We've uh, engineered our contracts uh, to be, we think, more customer friendlier. But I would submit to you that if you haven't moved to the cloud by now, now is the time to move to the cloud. Uh, everyone is using the cloud every day, right? We're using the cloud in our personal lives. We're using the cloud when we're using our smartphones. A lot of the data which is stored, uh, which we use with our smartphones are stored in the cloud. If we're using social media, a lot of that data is stored uh, in the cloud. So whether we realize it or not, whether we like it or not, we're all using the cloud every single day. But when you're thinking about moving to the cloud, you need to make sure that you're selecting a cloud services provider that you can truly trust. Because of course, cloud services providers have access to your data and to the data of your clients and your customers. And it's important that you really do a deep investigation to understand how are they protecting your data in the cloud. We've developed a framework at Microsoft as to how you may want to go evaluate potential cloud services providers. And this framework is really based upon four key principles. The first one is security, especially from a physical security perspective. How is a cloud provider truly protecting your data in their data centers? What sort of leading security measures are they taking to uh, keep private your data in, in, in their cloud? Privacy. Uh, and control. Later on this week, a big um, wide sweeping privacy law is going to go into effect. Many of us are aware of it. It's the European Union General Data Protection Regulation. Ask your cloud provider whether or not they're going to be complying with the GDPR. At Microsoft, come Friday, we've got terms in our cloud uh, contract uh, provisions which states that we're going to be complying with the GDPR. So we've been GDPR ready for quite a long period of time. Find out from your cloud services provider, what are they doing in the area of compliance? How are they enabling you to meet your own particular compliance needs? Especially if you're a regulated company like a healthcare provider or a financial services provider. Really get into that level of detail. And then finally, transparency. How is your cloud provider uh, being transparent with regard to their cloud businesses, business practices? Do they tell you where your data is stored in their cloud computing systems. What do they convey out to the marketplace regarding their cloud business practices? If you want some more information about the Microsoft Cloud, you can simply go to our Microsoft Trust Center where we convey out a wealth of information about our security and privacy and compliance story. Some folks have said that we've over communicated too much information on that uh, website. Maybe too many white papers, maybe way too much information, but I'd rather work with a cloud provider who's over communicating versus under communicating. So I wanted to share some thoughts also about one of our flagship cloud computing products known as Office 365. This 
for those of you who are not familiar with Office 365, this is uh, our Office cloud-based solution, which contains a number of Office, um, Microsoft Office workloads. And then the Microsoft legal department, as you would expect, we're a pretty big legal department. We have over 1,400 legal professionals scattered across the globe. In many respects, we're like a large law firm. And every single day, the Microsoft legal professionals are using the various workloads of Office 365 to collaborate better, to achieve more. And I want to share some examples as to how we're using Office 365 every day to achieve more. One of the key workloads which we're using all the time as Microsoft legal professionals in Office 365 is a, is a workload called Skype for Business. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Skype uh, for Business. But I remember when my colleague Nathan joined uh, our company about five years ago, um, Nathan said, hey, Dennis, I love, I love my office. We had offices at that time. Nowadays, we don't have offices. But he said, I love my office. I love my laptop, but you didn't give me a phone. Where's my phone? You forgot to give me a phone. I'm like, well, the Microsoft legal teams don't have phones. We use Skype for business. We speak into our computers. We have a headset. That's how we uh, connect with our uh, business clients and the outside world through our unified communication um, <laughs> solution, Skype for business. And so that enables us to have lots of mobility. We don't need to be in a Microsoft office. We can work from Starbucks, we can work from home. It allows us great uh, flexibility. Skype for Business is also terrific because you'll know who's on a call. For so many years when I practiced law, I'd get on conference calls, I would have no idea who's on a call unless they're announcing themselves. But when you're using Skype for Business, generally speaking, you can see someone's phone number or uh, if they're federated to the system, you may be able to see their name and their picture if they're also using Skype for Business. It's easy to connect with your uh, clients and other parties through Skype for Business. It has a very sophisticated instant message uh, feature. So I work with our colleagues across the world. So if I need to connect with one of my colleagues in Saudi Arabia, I can see if he or she is available, or if they're present or not, or if they're on vacation, or if they're busy, or if they're on a conference call. So it's easy to connect with each other seamlessly. A lot of our business clients who we work with at Microsoft, they're not co-located with us in Chicago. They're scattered throughout the globe. It's easy to project out your screen through Skype for Business. So much of what I do is shaping and negotiating contracts with our customers and partners. So we're reviewing contract terms during our Skype for Business calls, but I can project out my screen and they can see the contract we're working on and we can collaborate together to agree to with alternative language and, and to partner more closely together. It's got a very rich video feature, and as I mentioned, it makes remote work very easy. So check out Skype for Business if you haven't already done so. Another important workload we use every day as part of Office 365 is something known as um, SharePoint Online. This is another key collaboration tool. And so we've created various portals powered by Office 365 and SharePoint to collaborate more seam seamlessly with each other and also with our business clients. Let me share this example of a portal which we've created called CELA Web. At Microsoft, we like our acronyms. CELA stands for Corporate External Legal Affairs. That's really the legal group at Microsoft. But we created this self-help website called CELA Web. And we point our business clients to go to this website to address a lot of the common issues which comes their way before connecting directly with a Microsoft lawyer. And this information, this website contains host and host of FAQs and other related information. So if you need to create a non-disclosure agreement, if you need to create a contract, instead of speaking directly to a Microsoft lawyer, you can go to CELA Web and you can do it yourself. And we have found that over a period of time, by directing our business clients to this website, this has freed up a lot of time for myself and Nathan and our colleagues in the uh, Microsoft legal department to really achieve more and to do more higher value work and to get out of some of the more routine work we've done for such a long period of time. This is a second example as to how we're using SharePoint online. This is a dashboard uh, called GSMO Sales Connect. GSMO is another acronym. It stands for our Global Sales and Marketing Operations Team. 
These are key business clients who we support in the field, really our salespeople, if you will. And so this is a dashboard which all the legal professionals in the Microsoft legal department in the field supporting the GSMO teams have access to. So we'll uh, have information there about our agreements and annotated agreements, fallback provisions to our agreements. When we have team calls, uh, we'll record the calls. And if you weren't able to go on, to participate in that call, you can listen to it on demand. But this is a key dashboard for all Microsoft legal professionals across the world to really help do their job and have information at their fingertips uh, so we can move uh, with a lot of agility and high velocity. So those are some examples as to how we're using SharePoint online. A third uh, workload which we're using more and more in the Microsoft legal department is something called Microsoft Teams. And this is one of my favorite workloads and I would encourage folks to, to really look into this. Well, Microsoft Teams is, is sort of an alternative to traditional email and to Outlook. Um, it's, it's sort of this um, way to collaborate uh, whereby it's a persistent chat connection uh, with, with our, our, our colleagues. And what you do is you can create a team as part of Microsoft Teams. So we've created a number of teams uh, with our <coughs> colleagues based upon certain key subject matter areas. We've also created teams based upon the makeup of our team. So you'll see here on the top, we have a, a team which Nathan and I are part of, our US field team, the CELA GSMO US team. And we've created these channels on certain uh, various uh, subject matter areas. And what we do there is we're posting information to our colleagues. It's highly transparent, everyone can see that. And if, we're, if we wanna have a conversation about let's say artificial intelligence, and we learn something interesting about artificial intelligence, we'll just post that to the, uh, to the channel uh, on, on our team site, and people can comment, and they can see everything, they can see the, the, the flow of the conversation. What we have found is that by using Teams and posting information to Teams constantly, that this has been a great resource for all of our teammates. And you don't really necessarily need to save emails because most of that information now is highly searchable through our Microsoft uh, Teams uh, site. And we've also have onboarded a number of new Microsoft legal professionals to our US team. And we have found that uh, using Teams has been a great way to onboard people. In fact, we created a unique channel here called Readiness Resources. So if we find that there's a new contact in the legal department pertaining to a particular area like antitrust or another discipline, if you will, we'll post that information to the Readiness Resources and people can look at it when needed. And when people come in to our group, they can consult the readiness resources and they can really hit the ground running. So check out Microsoft Teams if you haven't already done so. We've also created Teams with our business clients as a way of de-lawyering, if you will. So a lot of times, Nathan and I will work with the same business clients time and time again. We'll see the same issues come up and we'll post materials to our team site with our business clients and when they have a an issue which comes up, which was a similar issue we dealt with a few weeks ago, we'll say, well, did you see our post from a few weeks ago on that, on that, on that particular subject matter area? Go back to that post and you'll have your, uh, answer, uh, you'll have your answer to your question right there. So again, check out Microsoft Teams. So let's pivot a little bit away from cloud to data. I know many of you have seen this, this phrase, I love this phrase, data is the new oil. Um, but I will say, at least in my experience, now for a lot of legal organizations, data is a pretty underutilized asset. And we need to do a better job, I think, as legal professionals to get richer sources of data and to really glean learnings associated with data. So let me, let me share some thoughts on that. Another interesting workload which we have as part of Microsoft Office 365 is something called Delve, Microsoft Delve, which sort of delves into information pertaining to how you're using email and some of the patterns with your email usage and, and your calendars and who you're connecting with and emailing with on a periodic basis. This slide depicts my email usage, I think over the past week or so. And so every week I get an email from Microsoft Dell giving me statistics as to my email practices and tendencies. They'll tell me, who is the person I'm collaborating uh, mostly with? You know, who's, who's sending me emails? Usually it's my boss or folks 
on my team, um, who are folks I'm not collaborating with that often who I may want to check in with. They'll tell me how many, how many hours am I spending uh, for, for meetings during the week? How much free time do I have where I have sort of alone time to think and, and, and to, to focus, uh, if you will. So I get, and all the Microsoft legal professionals get these statistics once a week, and I think that they're kind of interesting because it, it can help you adapt your ways of working uh, together. And you may say to yourself, well, maybe I'm reading too many emails after hours or on the weekends, maybe I need to spend more time with my family instead of reading emails. But it's that kind of information and data, which I think could be interesting to all of us to, to sort of adapt how we're all working. I think data can play a big role um, for in-house legal departments and also law firms in structuring something known as alternative fee arrangements, AFAs, or sort of fixed fee arrangements, but there's different types of uh, AFAs. Back last August, um, Microsoft, we made a, a, uh, an announcement that uh, moving forward for our big law firms who we partner with, and we've got 10 or 11 or 12 strategic firms who we work with, and of course, they're some of our most important firms. We spend a lot of money with these firms, but we, we sent uh, sort of an edict out there, that, out there that over a three year period of time, um, we're going to shift and move our outside counsel law firms to an alternative fee arrangement over a period of time. I think 90%, I think the statistic was 90% uh, of the work, but over a three year period of time. A lot of folks in the industry uh, stood up and they noticed that, they saw that. Um, the point being is I think you're gonna see more and more corporate in-house legal departments uh, requiring their outside counsels to differentiate themselves and to come up with fixed fees or alternative fee arrangements. And I think by having more data, more data as to how your law firm resources are utilized, what they're doing, what sort of work are they doing, how much time are they spending on a particular matter. And by contrast, in an in-house legal department, if you have some better data as to how uh, your, your law firms are delivering work for you, you're gonna be able to come up with a more compelling and thoughtful alternative fee arrangement, which hopefully makes sense for both your outside solution provider uh, and also your in-house legal department. I think another interesting piece regarding data is I think data, if used the right way, can also help drive some improved diversity and inclusion. I love this quote here from the management guru, Peter Drucker, where he said many years ago that what's measured improves. As we all know, and this is not controversial at all, uh, in the legal profession, I think we have a diversity and inclusion crisis, if you will. There's a lot more which we need to do uh, to improve DI and uh, in the legal profession, to have more women uh, in more senior level roles in the legal profession, to have more underrepresented minorities in, in senior roles in the legal profession. And we've talked about this for a long period of time, but there probably hasn't been the sort of action which we need, quite frankly. But I think if you're, you, you, we could all do a better job at DNI by measuring some of the data associated with diversity and inclusion. It's something that we've been focusing on in our Microsoft legal department uh, over the last few years. I think we've made some very good strides in this area. Microsoft all up, we published our statistics regarding DNI uh, for the entire company. In our US field team, which Nathan and I are part of, we have 42 folks uh, on our team. 39 of those 42 folks, I think about 93%, are either women or underrepresented minorities. And it's been a journey for us to, to improve those numbers over a period of time, but the key part is you need to be purposeful in your approach, you need to constantly measure and track how are you doing in the DNI space? I think data can help us improve and drive DNI. There's so much rich data on social media. Some of you may or may not know I'm a huge fan of social media, especially Twitter, especially LinkedIn. This is a screenshot of our president and chief legal officer. His name is Brad Smith. Brad uh, has a big presence both on LinkedIn and, and Twitter. I would encourage folks to, to follow Brad, especially on Twitter. He, uh, He'll, he gives lots of speeches across the world and he'll provide some, some great perspective and in, in context as an ambassador, not just of Microsoft, but I think of the technology uh, industry all up. But the key point here is I think there's lots of data on social media which we can learn. Uh, I use Twitter as my primary news feed. I don't really read newspapers anymore. I don't read it online or in the print media, but I follow about 1,300 
people uh, and companies and, and uh, law firms and other groups on Twitter, and that's my primary news source for a lot. A lot of people nowadays are using Twitter as your as your primary news source. And I get so much information from Twitter. I get better information about Microsoft through my Twitter feed versus what I receive through email through my colleagues at Microsoft, right? Which is sort of interesting. But the point is, you can learn so much information by following people on Twitter and also LinkedIn. Make sure that you have a significant uh, social media presence. I think social media also provides all of us with opportunities to brand our companies, right? And to sort of evangelize the firms and the companies which we work for, to be an ambassador to them. It also helps you brand your own uh, uh, perspective and your professionalism and your skills and to network with other parties. Let's pivot a little bit away from data. Let's talk about a hot topic for everyone, artificial intelligence, also known as uh, AI. And as we all know, and this is a phrase which I use, I think it's, it is really AI all the time. Uh, we're, we're seeing a lot written and publicized in the media, print media, social media, digital media, across the world about the, the rise of artificial intelligence. There may be some hype associated with it, but there's no doubt there's been lots of conversation about artificial intelligence. I think a lot of it is being fueled by big technology companies, companies like my company and the other companies which are represented on this slide. I would also say it seems like there's been a, um, a terrific, what I would call, war for AI talent AI engineers are in, are in you know, great demand, and uh, they're highly coveted uh, throughout our industry. But I think we need to realize that when you're thinking about AI solutions and AI tools, it's sort of at a beginner stage, if you will. We're in the early years of artificial intelligence. In many respects, artificial intelligence is, is like a baby. Uh, it's still in its infant years, but at Microsoft, we're seeing more and more of our customers become excited and very interested in the potential of using AI solutions and our cognitive solutions to help them digitally transform, to help them better serve their customers, and also be more competitive. And here's a few examples. This is an example of one of our leading customers. Customer's name is Progressive Insurance. I'm sure you're familiar with Progressive's uh, spokeswoman uh, Flo. Flo actually went to my college, Binghamton University. I did not know Flo, but she seems like a very nice uh, person, but she is their spokesperson. And you'll see her on commercials and ads. Well, Progressive has used our Microsoft cognitive services and cloud technology to create a chatbot called Flo the Chatbot. And Flo the Chatbot is out there to answer your questions regarding Progressive's uh, services. So you can go to Flo and you can get a quote uh, for automobile insurance from Progressive. Flow can also answer uh, other questions that you may have regarding Progressive's uh, suite of products. But the key point is we're seeing more and more of our customers use digital assistants and chatbots to better connect and provide differentiated services and value to their clients. This is a deal which we struck uh, last month uh, with a, a company, actually a nonprofit organization called the American Center for Mobility. They're based in the Detroit uh, area. And as we all know, it's just gonna be a matter of time before we see autonomous vehicles uh, out there, right? A lot of technology companies and automotive companies are using data and AI to create these autonomous vehicles. We struck a deal with them whereby the American Center for Mobility will be using our cloud service known as Azure uh, to help uh, work with, with uh, research companies and automobile companies to, to test drive and test run their autonomous vehicles and also to, uh, to help smooth things over uh, with, with regards to their connected car technology. But we're seeing automotive companies embrace AI uh, and data. And finally, also healthcare, obviously healthcare there's great opportunities for healthcare and using AI tools. Uh, AI tools will help uh, physicians and doctors be better diagnose issues with patients and, and to provide sort of more high impact uh, services uh, to their patients and those uh, in need. But we're also seeing lots of movement uh, regarding artificial intelligence in the legal industry. And these are just a few representative headlines which I've been able to collect over the past year or so about the potential impact of AI in our legal profession. My favorite 
headline here is from the Wall Street Journal, that this robot will handle your divorce free of charge. Kind of interesting. Uh, we'll see if that actually happens or not. But there's been lots of chatter out there about the potential impact in, of artificial intelligence in the legal profession. I spoke to a group of law students at Northwestern Law School uh, last week, and they had some questions about you know, my thoughts as to you know, what's, what's going to be the impact of AI on the legal profession in terms of jobs? Will these young law students have jobs in the legal profession five or 10 or 15 years from now? You know, we don't know what the impact is going to be necessarily uh, upon the legal profession marketplace. Only time will tell. But I do think there's great opportunities for all of us to embrace AI solutions to practice law at what I call a higher level and to get out of the business of such you know, mundane, boring, repetitive um, work, which lawyers have performed for so long, which these AI solutions will increasingly be able to do. And so let me share some examples, uh, first from a, from a Microsoft perspective. We've been um, working in designing some, some legal support and self-help, if you will, by using digital assistance and chat box to interact directly with our um, business clients. And as one example, I know I referenced the uh, the CELA web uh, site earlier. As part of that CELA website, we've deployed a bot. That bot's name is Lexi. And Lexi is a contract web, that's the name, the, the name of the piece of our CELA web uh, site, but it's really a digital assistant to help our business clients navigate uh, through, through our self-help uh, resources. So if you want to create a contract, uh, you can connect with Lexi. Lexi will help you through the steps of that. If you want to find a contract pertaining to a Microsoft customer or partner, instead of you doing that on your own, Lexi can assist you to do that. We've also created a bot called the Zella, Z-E-L-A bot. And this is a bot which uh, interacts directly with our business clients who are part of our sales, marketing, and operations team. So we have found over a period of time that our salespeople will oftentimes ask us the same questions time and time and time again. We're providing the same answers time and time again. So my colleagues and I use Microsoft technology known as Microsoft Azure Q&A Maker to create this bot, uh, which can interact with our business clients. And this bot is conversant on these six subject matters at the, at the bottom below here. So if you want to uh, ask uh, uh, the chatbot a question about uh, how Microsoft inspires trust in the cloud with our trusted cloud narrative. What are we doing in the area of, let's say, GDPR compliant? You can ask a question of, to the bot, and the bot will provide you with a ready-made answer, which you can use with your customers or other third parties. And we have found that ever since we've deployed this bot, this bot has really helped us free up time for Microsoft lawyers and legal professionals to do higher value work, to do more mission critical work. And again, this is very much still at its early stages. The bot's gonna learn more information over a period of time. We're gonna give more information to feed the bot, if you will, and the algorithm will get smarter over an extended period of time. Um, we're also focused, of course, at Microsoft. Uh, we've got a saying that Microsoft runs on trust, and of course, we take compliance very seriously. We've done a lot to build our culture of compliance at Microsoft. And we've also created a tool which we've been using, I believe for the past year or so, known as the High Risk Deal Solution Tool uh, to help us make smarter decisions in the area of compliance. At a high level, the way this tool works is that we may receive information from one of our business clients pertaining to an opportunity or a deal with a customer or a reseller or, or a partner somewhere along the, in the world. And that information is then fed into uh, this solution. And that information is then reviewed by an algorithm. And this algorithm is based upon a lot of the lessons learned we have accumulated for so many years on how to be smarter uh, on compliance issues. And so this algorithm will look at the data and we'll provide out a score as to the likelihood of whether or not there'll be a compliance issue with this particular sales or customer opportunity. And if it's a you know, higher score, my understanding is, you know, a greater likelihood of a compliance issue, a lower score, lower likelihood. And depending upon the score, this solution will also provide some um, 
best practices or risk mitigation techniques to prevent this issue uh, from being a compliance-related matter. Uh, so this is a tool which we're using increasingly, a way to use technology to be smarter in the compliance space. But there's lots of other uh, use cases for AI solutions um, in the legal space. And this is a graphic uh, which was put together by a company called Law Geeks. It was actually published last week. Law Geeks is an AI solution provider, leading AI solutions provider, and they came up with a buyer's guide, if you will, on AI solutions. And this was the graphic they, 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 they came up with. And I, what I like about this graphic Uh, for AI and some of the leading vendors for those AI uh, uh, solutions. And so my heritage of uh, being a lawyer now for over 20 years has been sort of a deal lawyer working on sophisticated IT information technology contract negotiations with customers, with partners, with other third parties. So when I see potential use applications of, of how uh, an AI solution provider can help me create or shape or draft a contract, something like that is very interesting to me. When I see an AI solution which can help us better manage our contract, uh, our contracts which we sign with third parties, give us more data and insight regarding the provisions which we've agreed to, to me that's very interesting. I like this um, other um, uh, use application for contract review. I spend so much time working on contracts with customers, I can't wait until there's a product out there, a really great product which will review a uh, customer's contract comments to our Microsoft Cloud terms and will give me an analysis as to what terms we can agree to, what we cannot agree to, maybe talking points regarding our positions, maybe providing uh, Microsoft fallback terms uh, as, as a way to al provide alternative uh, provisions uh, to, to as part of that negotiation. And there's other uh, solutions which you'll see here. Solutions regarding um, legal analytics, solutions regarding um, legal research. For so long, you know, I remember doing lots of legal research as a younger lawyer. Now there is these AI fuel solutions which can do the legal research for you uh, very quickly uh, and in a very comprehensive fashion. So we're seeing an incredible growing landscape uh, in AI uh, tools targeted to the legal industry. And I think as part of that, as part of that report, there's like a 65% year over year increase in AI solution providers providing targeted legal solutions. Although there's great promise in abilities for AI solutions to achieve more, I think we also need to take a step back and realize that there could be some challenges in using AI solutions, right? AI solutions is not a, a so-called proverbial silver bullet, right? And this, uh, this, this is a, a slide which depicts what we think at Microsoft are six key ethical principles that we need to keep top of mind uh, as we're out there utilizing AI solutions. And we actually published a book a few months ago called The Future Computing. It's our view as to the, in that book we lay out our vision for artificial intelligence in society and in industry, but we also uh, review what we think are these six key ethical principles. I'm not gonna go through all these principles, you can read them, you can take a look at the book, but I wanted to call out a few of them. The first uh, key principle I would call out is of course, when you think of AI, a key piece of AI is this notion of having massive and massive amounts of data to train the algorithm. So the algorithm constantly learns and gets smarter. By having massive amounts of data though, you need to make sure that that AI solution provider is respecting and protecting your data from a security and privacy perspective. That is of paramount uh, importance. So you need to make sure you're doing some thoughtful due diligence with your AI provider to understand how are they protecting your data and also uh, your, your customer's key data. Accountability and responsibility, that's another key ethical principle. I think about a month or so ago, unfortunately there was a fatality, the first fatality, I think in Arizona, pertaining to a, a, a driverless uh, autonomous vehicle. Uh, who is responsible uh, in that situation where you're using data and AI to power an autonomous vehicle? Is it the manufacturer? Is it, the, is it the operator of the vehicle? Is it the AI solution uh, provider who's powering up the, uh, the solution for that vehicle? We need to sort of figure that out and apportion that liability over a period of time. I think another key value is this notion of inclusiveness. 
You want to make sure you're developing algorithms which hopefully don't contain lots of biases, right? So you want to make sure that you're hiring uh, people who are developing these algorithms which come from a diverse and inclusive background. You want to make sure that you're developing these algorithms with sort of an inclusive and diverse toolkit <laughs> in mind as well. And that's, that's going to be a larger issue uh, for society, I believe. I want to, before I move here, I want to just play this, uh, th this video here for, for a second. Uh, this video um, is narrated by one of our colleagues in the United Kingdom uh, who has a disability. And I think this is an incredible video that shows about the power and potential of artificial intelligence to improve uh, the lives of so many people and to promote more accessibility. So here's the video. I'm Sakib Sheikh. I lost my sight when I was seven. And shortly after that, I went to a school for the blind. And that's where it was introduced to talking computers. And that really opened up a whole new world of opportunities. I joined Microsoft 10 years ago as a software engineer. I love making things which improve people's lives. And one of the things I've always dreamt of since I was at university was this idea of something that could tell you at any moment what's going on around you. I think it's a man jumping in the air doing a trick on a skateboard. I teamed up with like-minded engineers to make an app which lets you know who and what is around you. It's based on top of the Microsoft Intelligence APIs, which makes it so much easier to make this kind of thing. The app runs on smartphones, but also on the pivot head smart glasses. When you're talking to a bigger group, sometimes you can talk and talk and there's no response and you think, is everyone listening really well? Or are they half asleep? And you never know. I see two faces, 40-year-old man with a beard looking surprised, 20-year-old woman looking happy. The app can describe the general age and gender of the people around me and what their emotions are, which is incredible. One of the things that's most useful about the app is the ability to read out text. Hello, good afternoon. Here's your menu. Okay, thank you. I can use the app on my phone to take a picture of the menu, and it's going to guide me on how to take that correct photo. Move camera to the bottom right and away from the document. And then it'll recognize the text. Read me the headings. I see appetizers, salads, paninis, pizzas, pastas. Years ago, this was science fiction. I never thought it would be something that you could actually do, but artificial intelligence is improving at an ever faster rate, and I'm really excited to see where we can take this. As engineers, we're always standing on the shoulders of giants, building on top of what went before. And in this case, we've taken years of research from Microsoft Research to pull this off. I think it's a young girl throwing an orange frisbee in the park. For me, it's about taking that far-off dream and building it one step at a time. I think this is just the beginning. Every time I see that video, I'm like, I'm, I'm in awe of the, of the power of technology to really influence and change people's lives. I think it's just amazing. So uh, I want to wrap up with some key takeaways in using technology in our profession. First takeaway, this is something we, we say a lot in Microsoft, especially since we since Satya Nadella became our CEO four plus years ago. This whole notion of having a learn it all mentality and not have a know it all mentality. This notion of embracing a growth mindset, constantly stretching, constantly learning. When you're thinking about the legal technology marketplace, there's great opportunities from us for us to learn from others, whether it's at this conference or maybe even learning from the growing legal tech community and movement, uh, which you'll see on social media uh, and, and online. So, you know, really try to embrace this mindset and learn from others and, and, and don't fear failure. Uh, this is something we talk a lot about at Microsoft too. Uh, a few years ago, we created a bot. Tay was the name of this bot, which we created. We released it, I think, uh, out, uh, out uh, on the internet. And unfortunately, Tay, the bot, uh, went a little haywire and said things that Tay should not be saying. Uh, but we learned a lot from that experience. It, you know, um, it didn't work out, but we went back to the drawing board and you're gonna make mistakes. You know, that's a reality, especially when you get into the intersection of, of the law and technology. Don't be fearful in making those mistakes. 
Second key point I would say is get help. And as a lawyer, I know I need lots of help. But what I mean by this is that a lot of lawyers are not gonna be experts when it comes to technology, right? And we know that as part of the uh, American Bar Association model rules, I forget which model rule it, it is, but there's a model rule about lawyers acting in a competent fashion. We need to represent our, our clients in a competent fashion. And there was a, a comment to that rule which was put in place, I think about six years ago, I think back in 2012, that, and that comment says that for lawyers to be competent, if they're using technology, they need to understand the risks and the benefits associated with that technology. It means that you don't have to be an expert on that technology, but you gotta know something about it. You know, how does it work? You can learn something about it by getting consultants or experts who can help educate you regarding how technology works. I think another key point, data point is for me, is, um, and we see this with a lot of our customers, leverage technology that you already have. This is something which actually is mentioned quite often by a former Microsoft colleague of mine. Her name is Lucy Bassley. Lucy used to lead up our legal operations team in the Microsoft legal department. We see a lot of our customers uh, who have bought our technology. Maybe they bought Office 365 already, but they're not using it for whatever reason. So when you think about technology uh, and the places in which you work, see what you already have and try to utilize as much as what you already have to your benefit. Maybe you don't need to buy something else. When you're starting uh, tech projects, um, at least from my perspective, I think it's always good to you know, be modest and start you know, small projects. Even if you're working with information technology specialists and leaders, Make sure that you, as the lawyers or legal professionals, are defining those requirements because you know your clients best, right? You know them better than the IT folks. Trust, this is something which I mentioned before. Our president and chief legal officer, Brad Smith, likes to say time and time again, this is so true, that customers are only gonna use technology that they can trust nowadays, right? That is absolutely uh, the case. But make sure you're doing a thoughtful evaluation and vetting of your technology providers. Get references, understand how they're gonna be protecting your data. You know, Look at their contract terms, really test them out, uh, if you will, and keep them honest. Keep in mind that as we move into this data, we're running in this data-centric world, but that's premised upon having really great, rich data. So make sure that you have your plumbing in order, if you will. Make sure you've got a sound data infrastructure where you're taking in good, thoughtful data so that you can yield the benefits of, of rich insights associated with that data. Keep in mind technology, especially artificial intelligence, especially artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence does not mean emotional intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a great tool for lawyers to use to hopefully achieve more, but artificial intelligence doesn't have empathy, it doesn't have social skills. It may have limited judgment. It doesn't really have self-awareness, right? It doesn't develop a bedside manner, if you will, with our key clients. There's key limitations to technology, especially with artificial intelligence, right? I think the last point I would make is uh, this whole notion about using uh, technology, adopting technology. And we see this a lot at Microsoft. You know, we've got great technology which we're using at Microsoft, as you would expect. But it's only good if you're actually using the technology, right? And people are saying tone at the top, senior leaders are actually using technology. So they set an example for others. So keep in mind, you can have the greatest technology in the world, but if you're not taking advantage of it and not using it, uh, then it's not gonna help drive your business forward. So with that said, that's what I have for you. I appreciate your time. Happy to open it up to whatever questions people may have. But thank you for your attention. Too. You got a few questions. Nathan, throw a question out there. So the question is, what do I think about the future regulation of use of AI by lawyers? Well, I mean, I think, I think there's a great opportunity for us as lawyers and legal professionals to shape that. I, I think it's incumbent upon us to get out on our front foot and 
maybe even lobby the American Bar Association, lobby local bar associations to help define that. Um, the reality is that there's no legal regime right now for AI. It sort of takes bits and pieces, especially from a, a privacy and data uh, security perspective. Um, but as we also know, you know, Congress hasn't really done, hasn't, hasn't moved swiftly in areas of regulation over the past few years. So I don't think we're going to see any sort of regulation uh, on AI from a congressional uh, perspective anytime soon. But I do think it's a great opportunity for, for lawyers to really understand that there are potential ethical and legal challenges with AI. And let's sort of work together and identify them and try to maybe come up with a guiding sense of, a set of principles or guidelines for this space. Yes. The, uh, the analytics piece where it shows how you're using the time and the email, have you been able to take that information and put on a model and use it for coaching and personal development? So the question is, um, you know, I showed some slides up there about um, the analytics associated with my email usage and time and have we uh, transform that into some programmatic way to do some formal coaching to teams. And I'm not aware of us doing that. I think it's been, at least in my experience, more done on a personal level where we get that information, each of us, on a weekly basis. And then we say to ourselves, well, how can we improve our ways of working? But I don't think, you know, we haven't had situations where we've had team meetings and and people will say, well, Dennis, just so the rest of the team knows, your utilization in this area is not so great. You need to improve that. Or I haven't had conversations with my manager where he'll look at the, that data, you know, and give me some coaching with some thoughts. I guess theoretically that could happen because Microsoft has that information. But I guess if my manager wanted to go and access that information and have a conversation with me on that, that could happen. But, but I have not seen that happen, at least in the legal department at Microsoft. Yes, Mary. Yeah, when you're talking about algorithm or the uh, AI and transparency, yes. um, how how can you uh, make those algorithms more transparent um, when you know we, we're taking a look at machine learning and everything seems to be uh, messy data uh, and uh, and there are tools applied to it. Uh, some of them are trade secret tools. Do you have any ideas on how to make that more transparent and uh, less prone to bias? It's a good question. I think it's something that we've been studying a lot, you know, in Microsoft and maybe coming up with a set of guiding principles as to how to be more transparent with regard to our algorithms. Um, from my perspective, I think part of it is just simplifying uh, some of the information as to how the, the information and data which these algorithms, you know, run under, how to convey that out to the marketplace. I think there's a tendency to sort of over-engineer that information, and even if you publicized it, no one would know what it means. So how do you simplify it? But on the other hand, how do you respect trade secret, patent rights, and social property rights too? And that's you know not an easy balancing act. So I don't really have a good answer for you, other than that. I think that's something which I think the industry all up has to sort of look into more detail and come up with some best practices. 